guys, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I am really excited to be joined on stage by Leticia Vandepute. She's a state senator from Texas. Congresswoman Martha Roby, one of the first women elected to the House from Alabama. And Kellyanne Conway, she is a strategist and pollster who focuses on trends in women's engagement. So this panel is pretty unique in that on stage right now we have someone who's currently in office in the House of Representatives, someone who is currently running for a lieutenant governor in Texas, and someone who's run campaigns and focuses on polling, including one pretty high profile campaign of a man against a woman. So we're really excited about this conversation. Congresswoman Roby, I want to start out with you. Um, we had Bo Williams on, who is the creator of um, House of Cards, and we have also the show Scandal based here in Washington. <laughs> I'm curious from your experience on the Hill, whether or not the portrayals of women in these shows are fair or reflective of what you see in Washington. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'd start out and say, is LA law an accurate depiction of the practice of law, or is <laughs> Grey's Anatomy the accurate depiction of a, uh, uh, a hospital and a, with serious medical issues? I mean, look, it's entertainment. It's great. I love House of Cards. My husband and I have enjoyed uh, watching it. Certainly, there's glimpses of, of the truth, but overall, it's, it's an entertaining show. Um, the realities here are you've got uh, women like all of us sitting here on the stage that are concerned about our country and uh, issues that are facing all of us in our homes, whether it's energy or the cost of food, because um, we're the ones putting gas in the car and going to the grocery store. Um, I don't think that there are women's issues. I think that the same issues that matter to men matter to me. And uh, the reality of Women on the Hill is, is that we bring a unique perspective. It's great to have a seat at the table in order to join the discussion and be a part of coming up with real solutions uh, to propel our country in, in the right direction. And Leticia and Kellyanne, I want to bring you into the conversation. What do you think about that and the Congresswoman's idea that there, there aren't really women's issues anymore? I think it's fair to say thank you, first of all, to Politico, Google, Tory Burch Foundation, and most of all you, not just for being here, but for being interested in these underlying issues and engagement. Thank you for all that you're doing. By the way, I just want to say as an aside, I spent 21 years in Washington, the last seven in Manhattan. I think you're very fashionable. <laughs> I do. I have to say, and I think we've got great restaurants. Whenever somebody in New York says, oh, the food in DC, I'm like, when were you there? In 1982 at Mel Krupen's Deli? Does anybody remember that? <laughs> Where, when was the last time you went there? Anyhow. So I just want to get that away. Um, uh, uh, yes, I do believe that there's way too much emphasis on the bifurcation between men and women as voters and what they care about. Men and, vo men and women in everybody's polling pretty much say that they're focused on the same big basket of issues, primarily jobs and the economy, for really the last seven or eight years. But women look at jobs and the economy differently, and this is frankly where a lot of Republican candidates get it wrong. Women talk more about everyday affordability and long-term financial security. And so if you just talk to them about the jobs report, or you talk to them about as job seekers, you talk to the unemployed, you're talking to seven and a quarter percent of the country. If you talk to just the job creators, you're talking to never, another seven and a quarter percent. But the vast majority of female households have our job holders. They're not job seekers, they're not job creators, they're job holders. And so if you have an economic agenda that talks about, again, the, f the cost of food and fuel, not necessarily macroeconomics, and long-term financial security and planning, uh, that, that really respects women to do the math. Let me just say something about women's issues. I'm going to put it out there. Uh, I think it's really divisive to, to constantly just pretend that all women care about is abortion. Uh, yes, we all care about it. We all have an opinion on it. But I feel really disrespected when the coverage is constantly around one issue. I, I feel like we, we do a million things in a day. We have a million thoughts in a day. And so what started out as abortion then became um, choice, then became reproductive freedom, and it sounded like ovaries in Superman outfits, and that was weird. So then it became um, women's health, and now it's just women's issues. And now pretty soon we're just going to have to touch our temple instead and, and know what we're all talking about. Ladies, don't give in to that. Say that's one of 10, 15, 20 things that you really care about. Kellyanne Conway, she's like, who is that? Um, doesn't mean anything. It's one of 15, 20 issues that we care about. But don't allow candidates and coverage of campaigns to just at be, you know, begin and end with, quote, women's issues and not include what you're telling pollsters are the most important issues to you. 
piece of about, yeah. Well, what I find is that women get defined by their roles in either legislative bodies, congressional bodies, uh, the committees that you get put on uh, in your not-for-profit organizations uh, that you are advocates for. Uh, and you've got to understand that for women, uh, don't let them do that. When I first got to the legislature, even though I was a pharmacist, um, I didn't want to be on the health committee. I wanted to be on the energy committee and telecommunications. I wanted to be on finance and banking because that's what interested me. Now, I do a lot of health care bills and <clears throat> education I deeply care about, but what my signature was known for was business and cybersecurity and veterans and military installations. But what I find is that even when I talk to women in the media, those, those women that whatever their platform is, whether it's on a blog or in a magazine or on TV or in print, they tend to get assigned the women's issues, mm -hmm. the stuff mm -hmm. that is the community affairs. So I think what we see in politics and in legislative democracy and representative democracy is not any different that we see in the corporate boardrooms or in our not-for-profit sector. And women need to be as assertive as they can at the very beginning with finding whatever your passion is and going for that. And don't let them talk you out of being the oil and gas person and expert. Uh, because what I find is once you get that credibility, no one can take it away from you. But don't let somebody else define you, your roles, or your domain. Mm. So with that, I want to talk about campaigns a little bit. You, you're currently engaged in one, obviously, you were a trailblazer, one of the first women elected in Alabama to the House. I'm kind of curious, <laughs> is, did you find that there was anything different about running for a political office as a woman? And frankly, should there be anything different? I would take this opportunity, first of all, to say, uh, Margaret Roby, my daughter, is, um, Margaret, will you just stand up and wave your hand? She's eight years old. She's here with me this week. <laughs> The reason I point out that she's here is number one, Margaret, look around the room, look at all of these women that are here. You can be anything you want to be. And that's how I was raised. My dad told me every single day, you can be anything you want to be. And I took him at his word. <laughs> it never occurred to me, not once, in running for the city council, uh, applying to law school, running for the city council, running for Congress, it never occurred to me once that I was a woman and that I couldn't do it. Because my dad told me every single day I could be anything I wanted to be. So there may have been people that <coughs> talked about me behind my back, uh, but they never said it to my face about you know, being a mom or you know, slack comments about that. Um, I just did it, and it, it really never occurred to me that I was a woman and that it should be any different. Um, I can tell you this, how it worked everybody else. And I think that um, we have uh, innately a, a drive inside of us because of the juggle. I think that's just the difference between sometimes men and women is that women know how to throw more balls up in the air and, um, and you should celebrate that. And you should, um, whether it's running a political campaign or um, running a nonprofit or uh, going after that job as a CEO. Uh, there should, women should never feel like they're in a position of having to make a choice between having it all. Being a mom of two beautiful kids, or six, yeah. <laughs> or four. four. Um, yeah. So I got nothing on these girls. <laughs> um, but you should never be, feel like you have to choose between the two because you can have it all. You just got to have a great support system around you to do it. But again, um, you know, my job with Margaret and her brother George is to make sure that they know every single day that they can be anything that they want to be. Well, it, it is different. That's and awesome. maybe there's a generational, um, I'm a grandmother of six, uh, but I'm when I <laughs> first ran for the legislature, um, there, there weren't very many women. In fact, when we were discussing it with the family, um, all my kids were under 10, so uh, it, it was kind of unusual for somebody with six kids under 10 who was a small business owner to run for the legislature. That just wasn't the profile. 
It was only one woman in the Texas Senate at the time. There was 31 senators. But when we talked about it, my youngest daughter said, well, why does mommy want to be a state representative? <laughs> and my oldest daughter, who was 10 at the time, said, because there's not enough mommies there. Oh, and it clicked. Yeah. It clicked. There was a little over a dozen in the 150-member <clears throat> house. And it wasn't that women just weren't there. It's just it's so much better for policymaking when you have different skill sets at the table. But it was difficult. Uh, it was difficult in that some of the harshest questions I got, uh, even coming from a predominantly Latino community, was, ¿Quién va a cuidar a los niños? Who, who's going to take who's care of take your kids? kids? Mm. Right? And when I answered, well, my husband is going to be taking, and they said, your husband's going to babysit? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, my husband is parenting. So I, uh, I don't babysit I my that. children. And so I think things have changed a lot in 23 years. But understand, you know, I come from a generation that went to school with the slide rule. So my mother, my dad were incredible <coughs> as far as making us really believe, all my brothers and sisters, that our possibilities were endless. Mm -hmm. And it was actually my mom who said, honey, your, your generation will be the first generation of women who will be defined not by who your daddy is or who you're married to. So own up to it. Make, make it your decision. That, to me, was the most powerful thing. Mm -hmm. But these two ladies have really beaten the odds. I want us all to appreciate who you're seeing before you, because most women will never ascend to that level. And frankly, most women will never even think of running for office and putting themselves out there, myself included. Why? Well, I think the old saw that you have to have the fire in your belly is still true, but now you have to have bile in your throat as well. And most women say, hey, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to sacrifice um, my family or my reputation or you know, put myself out there. And also, do you know the number one reason why women tell pollsters they don't run for office? Because nobody ever asked them. Nobody ever suggested. And the, the reverse is true, too, when somebody says, you know, you'd be great at that. You just you wrote the best letter to the editor. You're always speaking up at the meetings. You're a great negotiator, always punctual. Um, men, nobody, they don't wait for anybody to ask them to run for office. They sort of look in the mirror and see a senator. And you know, we, <laughs> we look in the mirror and see somebody who's tired. So they, you know, they wait for, we, women generally wait for people to ask them. So I'm telling you today, go ask someone. Go ask someone in your life, go ask a woman to run. Now, let me just say quickly, as a consultant, I wish it were true, and I wish I, I listened to Lois's, Lois Romano's great interview with Robbie from L, and I wish it were true in politics what Robbie said, that you know at L they say it's not the dress, it's the woman in the dress, but it's not true. The coverage of female candidates, particularly at the national level, when Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin ran, was yeah. disgraceful. I have four children, three of whom are girls. I would never, after that campaign, I felt so icky about encouraging any of them to ever run for office. And they're little, little, so maybe things will change. But to have a 746 word article in a major newspaper discussing Hillary Clinton's cleavage, and then about five months later having a major commentator on a cable station say, the best way, this is brilliant to pick Sarah Palin because that's a great way to market her. I want to get in bed next to her. Where, where are the, where's the comparable coverage, ladies? Where's the comparable coverage about the beer belly, paunchy beer belly and bad comb over? Where is that? <laughs> you know, you're not going to read those articles. So I'm telling you, own it. If you see the coverage like that, say, I want to know, I don't know, I want to, don't want to know what she wore today. I want to know what she said. Yeah. I just want to tag on to that, too, about the asking women. When, when Riley and I, my husband Riley, when we came up to D.C., and it's been five years ago next month, which is hard for me to wrap my mind around, but um, when we came up, my son was 12 weeks old, uh, Margaret was four, and we were, you know, kind of vetting whether or not this is something we want to do. And it wasn't John Boehner, it wasn't Eric Cantor, it wasn't Kevin McCarthy, it wasn't any of the men that I met with that convinced me that I could do this and that I could do it successfully. The last meeting that I had on the last day that we were here, and of course I was emotionally just exhausted kind of going through this process of am I going to run for Congress and wrapping my head around how big, big of a step this was, in walked Kathy McMorris Rogers. And she sat down and she looked me in the eye and she said, you can do this. 
you can do this. And that was what it took to convince me that I could do it. Because here was a mom uh, with, with a young child, at that time she only had one, um, that was already doing it. And so I would just say that we have a responsibility to say to you, you can do this. And, and the way we recruit more women to come and run for office, whether it be Congress or at the local level, is to be encouraging them and say, you can do this. So I just wanted to tag that little story on. Um, Kellyanne, I want to go to you next. For people who maybe don't know your biography as well as some of us do, they might be surprised to hear that you worked with Todd Aiken and his campaign. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it was like to be involved and how you respond to people who might be surprised that someone who's as in-depth in women issues was involved in that campaign. Uh, well, I was only peripherally involved. We did one poll for him in the primary. He won the primary. Then he said what he said, and I never did work for them again. I sort of left the campaign as a consultant. So, um, so I don't have a lot of perspective on that. I think Todd, uh, Congressman Aiken's comment was beyond the pale. I mean, who? I don't think anybody's responsible for that comment but him. Um, but you know, last year I did work on a couple of different races that I think are instructive to this particular conversation. A very high-profile race that we worked on was um, Congressman Steve King, and he was running against uh, Christy Vilsack, who's the former first lady, very popular, affable, very intelligent, very well-spoken on the issues, just a you know, very competitive candidate. In the, she was a card-carrying member of the War on Women. You know, really in the 2012, she had all the King's courses, all the King's men campaigning for her, including the president. Her husband sits in President Obama's cabinet as his agricult agriculture secretary. So it was a real, you know, tough climb. And, um, and so we, you know, we help female candidates who are trying to navigate the waters, and then we help people who are running against female candidates as well. But I think the difference in that race, frankly, in Iowa, was people wanted to talk about federal issues like the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, jobs and the economy, but they also wanted to talk about local issues. They also wanted to talk about the farm bill or agricultural issues or um, so, and immigration, frankly. But I think that was a good case of a great candidate in Christy Vilsack, you know, d d playing up too much that I'm going to be the first congresswoman ever elected from Iowa or the war on women, the abortion, abortion, abortion. And Iowa voters are like, well, what about the things that we're telling you we care about? And it was, he won by like eight points. It wasn't a squeaker. But we, you know, we, we've seen it from both perspectives. I, um, uh, in, in different races that we've, that we've run, and then, you know, I ran, I was the first time pollster for Michelle Bachman last time. She's retiring this time, and it was the first time I ever did a race for her. And she won by about a point or less. And, you know, she is attacked daily. People say she's attacked for her views and her statements. She's attacked daily, daily, about what she, how her hair looks, what she's wearing, who thought, you know, why does she think she's, she can run for president? Nobody asked any of the men who ran for president, why do you think you should have run for president? It's just, it's, it's just unbelievable. So we see it from both perspectives. Lisa, you, so you've made it pretty clear that you're um, not running in your race to play second fiddle to Wendy Davis, that, but there's no arguing that she has an incredibly strong national profile. There are countless stories in the D.C. Right. and national publications about her. How do you kind of break out of that shadow on your own while still maintaining some kind of balance there in your campaign? Well, uh, first of all, I have to tell you, I rarely play second fiddle to anybody. <laughs> uh, I like that. Uh, and, and the reason is, uh, if I did, there would be no way that I would be Senator Leticia Vandepute, um, the girl from San Antonio whose both grandmothers were born in Mexico running for lieutenant governor. Now, you got to understand the position of lieutenant governor in the state of Texas. While in other states, it may be you wait in, in the second just in case or you do a lot of ribbon cuttings. Uh, our lieutenant governor is extremely powerful. Uh, our governor doesn't have a cabinet. Our governor doesn't set the budget. It's the legislature. I think it's part of holdover from the Texas Constitution when we were a republic, a very populist idea that you needed a strong legislative uh, section and a very weak executive branch. Uh, Wendy and I are Democrats. We are friends. Uh, we're both sisters in the Senate. Wendy has her campaign, and I have mine. Now, there are a lot of things, I think, that are going to be very synergistic. Um, but I have to run on my own. And so sometimes uh, when folks say, oh, I'm 
so glad you and Wendy have $14 million. I have to remind them, no, that's not the case. Uh, so I've always invited them, oh, come on my website so you can donate to me. But I, I have to run an incredible uh, campaign. And the issues that I'm sticking to are the issues that I think the state and the people want to hear. And that's about affordability of college, that's about our public education system, that's about a transportation system, uh, water for us. If you don't have water, you don't have jobs. And yes, I'm a woman, yes, I'm a healthcare professional, but it's part of, of the issues. But what I have found is that people are willing to listen uh, if you make that case. The tough part is you need the resources to make that case. So one of the most difficult thing, I think, for women candidates is to be able to raise the amount of money you need to get your message out, to get the resources out. And finally, we've begun to see where women are supporting other women. Uh, because for the longest time, uh, we didn't have the type of political action committees that were dedicated to electing women. That, that, is, that, that, that is changing. But, you know, for me, I'm the pro-business Democrat. I uh, do a lot of work in veterans, military, and that's kind of what, what I'm known for. But I think that there's an advantage right now for us in Texas. We are a very conservative state. When we were a Democrat state, we were a very conservative state. But what I find is that people are willing to listen if you, first of all, listen to them. The difference, I think, in a lot of political campaigns is that uh, politicians are just so eager to tell you what they think. And I can tell you, 33 years being across the prescription counter as a neighborhood pharmacist, I have to listen. I have to listen first and understand why folks aren't taking their medication as they are. I have to listen to the constituents. I have to listen. And you know what? If you listen, it makes you a better policymaker, it makes you a better office holder. So I'm trying to raise the resources so I can get that listening uh, opportunity across the state, and that's what's different. Um, I expect that Wendy and I will be doing a lot of things together at events, but they are two separate campaigns. We've only got a couple minutes left, so I want to make sure everybody who's watching online and in the room has something to take away. If there is a woman or, or a man who's out there watching and they want to be in the seat that you're in five years from now, ten years from now, give me your one piece of advice of how do you make the leap from being in these seats to being in those seats? I'll start with you, Kellyanne. Winners are people who are willing to lose, so don't be afraid of risking loss. Your life won't change that dramatically. You'll still have your family, your health, your future. If you really feel like you can make a contribution either as a consultant or a campaign manager, a fundraiser, or the candidate herself, I would encourage you to do it. Um, and and I, th I think the most instructive thing that you could take away from today is uh, play, to, play to our strengths as being seen as less corruptible, more ethical, um, more able to negotiate, to forge consensus, to listen. And also to work on issues, you know, the, I call them the she cluster of issues, social security, healthcare, education. But don't back down on the we cluster, the war and the economy, if you will, the, the matters of strength. And, um, and remember that people ask, people ask of candidates, the same thing they ask of products or services or friendships. They say first, do I like you? That's the easy part, that's the living room test. Do I want you, am I gonna be proud if you're my lieutenant governor? Do I want to see you representing 660,000 of us in the United States Congress? Do I like you is the living room test. The connective tissue is really, are you like me? And that's where female candidates have more of an advantage than you may realize. You have so much more shared experience commonality with voters than, than you probably realize. And those shared experiences, that biographical connection, that connective tissue, is incredibly important to voters because then they feel like you are accessible. They feel like you're not just, that you're not above them, that you're one of them, and that you're really carrying that torch for them. And I fully encourage you to put yourself out there and don't be afraid of losing. Congresswoman. I mean, I certainly would agree with all of that. And she has a unique perspective as a consultant. We as candidates, you know, we need to be listening to these guys, right? Um, and, and I would just say, though, going back to what I said before, um, you know, Hillary Clinton got it right when she said it takes a village. Uh, I would just add on to that, choose your village. Um, you've got to have a good group of people around you, whether you're running for political office 
or you're running the campaign or you're, you're looking at that corporate ladder and wanting to get to the top um, and you don't have to choose. I can't emphasize this enough. Any opportunity that I have to speak to young people, uh, particularly young women, uh, what I want to say to them is maybe, maybe they didn't grow up in a home like I did where my dad told me every single day you can be anything you want to be. But my job is to encourage them and say, you can be anything you want to be. But you don't have to choose. You, you can be a wife and a mom and a congressman or a wife and a mom and a lieutenant governor, a wife and a mom and a campaign consultant or a wife and a mom and CEO of, of, a, of a Fortune 500 company. You just you, can't sleep ever again. Right. <laughs> I'm tired. And you will invest in a lot of makeup. <laughs> um, they asked me if I needed to put powder on my nose and my daughter was like, she's got on enough makeup. <laughs> but, but you can. And so I, I would just leave you with that. Um, make sure you've got folks around you to help you. And you can't be afraid to ask people for help. I mean, you, you, can, have, you can be anything you want to be, uh, but you got to be willing to say, hey, can, can you help me for a minute with this or that or the other? Um, but anyway, I just, again, let me just say thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me thank be you. a part of this really important discussion today. This has been really great. All right, Senator, I'm getting the hook here. So a quick bumper sticker version of what you would like these people to take. <laughs> uh, my grandmother only had a third grade education, and she always had these little wise sayings that we called dichos. And what she used to say was, el que sabe que no sabe sabe algo, which means if you know what you don't know, you know something. <laughs> For women about to make a decision in your career or about your life, find out what you don't know. It's only when you get everything on the table and the analytics that you can make the decision that's right for you. And if it's not running for office, know that you can be right alongside somebody who is or making a difference no matter where you are. Thanks. All right, well, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Thank you all so much for joining us. It was fun. Thank you.